It is a pleasure for me to introduce the first of our speakers for this second part of our afternoon, Dr. Richard Weinberg. I'm going to say a little bit about Rich's formal qualifications and experience, but Rich is a University Distinguished Teaching Professor Emeritus of Child Psychology, and he was an adjunct professor of psychology and educational psychology at the university. He served as the director of the Institute of Child Development from, for 10 years, from 1989 to 1999, and for many years, and the reason that he's going to speak here today, is he was one of the founders and directors of SEED. And for that, we are quite grateful that 40 years ago, he had the foresight to say, wow, we, need to, we have a lot to offer the field of early care and education, but we need a vehicle for how to disseminate information or, quote unquote, how to give away information about child development. And so, for, as I said, for that, we are so appreciative and also wanted to hear from Rich um, his perspectives on reflecting back to 40 years of SEED. And so I'm going to turn it over to Rich to give us his perspective, which we so greatly appreciate. In case you were wondering who the big bird is on the board, that's me. And the little boy is our four-year-old son at the time. And he was so delighted when he came home from Dayton's department store, where I played Big Bird, and said, Daddy, 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 I met Big Bird. I didn't have the heart to tell him it was me <laughs> until about six months later. And I think he's still angry at me, even though he's in his 40s. Well, after four decades, it's about time that we sit around the campfire and reminisce a little bit about how seed came to be, and for us to recount a bit of its history. SEED was founded, as you know, in 1973, in response to the growing national interest in early childhood education and the need to coordinate within the University of Minnesota the multiple efforts of various disciplines committed to the welfare of young children and their families. What characterized the zeitgeist when a revolution in American early childhood education was occurring in the early 1960s and 70s. A number of social, political, and economic factors, as well as major discoveries about the psychological development of children, precipitated major changes in the ways that Americans viewed young children and their early development. To begin with, our national awareness was focused on the individual citizens' civil rights. Our concerns were reflected in part in Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty and various programs offered through the Office of Economic Opportunity. Project Head Start, perhaps one of the most influential and massive federal social experiments in our history, was introduced as a preschool intervention. Its impetus was rooted in a commitment to the physical and psychological welfare of the nation's poor and was built on the assumption that if economically disadvantaged children often minorities, were provided with an opportunity to develop learning readiness skills prior to their initiation to a formal public school experience, they would more easily adapt to the educational system and achieve academic success. The Crusaders believed that such an intervention would alter the poverty cycle by increasing educational and occupational opportunities. Also, a reconsideration of the social and economic positions of men and women in our society occurred at that time. The changing role of mothers who joined the nation's workforce was a catalyst for the child care movement. The socialization of little boys and girls also came to reflect shifting roles and values. The perception of little girls as sugar and spice and everything nice, who play with dolls and become either teachers or nurses, was challenged by a view that gender should not determine one's vocational choices, interests, or toys. Moving women from the kitchen and carpool to the executive's office and operating room, as doctors this time, resulted in new patterns of parenting and also influenced the goals and curricula of many contemporary early education programs. The discovery of young children as a treasured national resource resulted in a burgeoning industry committed to stimulating and accelerating children's development. 
revised baby and child care books and grocery store journals bombarded parents with a dizzying array of how-to activities. Some books guided parents to Pygmalion-like efforts to transform their children into geniuses. Adults could play a more active role in increasing their children's IQ and could be provided with a new reason to experience guilt as inadequate parents. No home with a newborn infant was complete without an automated crib mobile and provided appropriate perceptual stimulation. Grandparents were urged to buy creative playthings for their grandchildren because these objects contributed to their development. Toilet training became a science. One wonders how many M&Ms were administered in the nation's bathrooms as rewards to toddlers who performed successfully. Overnight, the television program Sesame Street became an early childhood educator responsible for millions of young children. Against this background in the early 1970s, a small group of us, Shirley Moore, Erna Fishout, Bill Hardup, who was then the uh, director of the Institute of Child Development, Lynn Gailey, Byron Eglin, Cindy Plaisance, who I see here today, and I gathered to spearhead several innovative programs under the new umbrella of SEED. The university had a well-established tradition in the area of early childhood licensure preparation. The Shirley G. Moore Laboratory School, as old as the Institute of Child Development, continues to provide state-of-the-art in science early childhood programs, as well as training and research opportunities. However, through SEED and with the support of former deans Jack Merwin, Bill Gardner, and Bob Brunix, we were able to introduce a variety of outreach programs, many funded by the Bush Foundation. These programs often focused on giving away child development to diverse professional groups in grassroots communities in Minnesota and neighboring states by employing a variety of instructional strategies, including tandem weekends, professional growth institutes, career fellowships, materials for parents, and a program for legislators and other policymakers called FactFind. Over the years, and more recently with the support of Deans Steve Eusen, Darlene Bailey, Jean Kwam, and David Johnson, who you heard from earlier, SEED has extended its reach with funds from the Irving B. Harris Foundation, Marty Erickson, Byron Eglin, and Betty Carlson have played a significant role in the arena of infant and early childhood mental health. Indeed, SEED has spread its wings to influence the early childhood policies and evidence-based practices within the state of Minnesota by participating in ventures such as the Urban Research and Outreach Engagement Center, known as UROC, in North Minneapolis. Most importantly, SEED has continued to provide an exemplary national model of multidisciplinary cooperation within an academic setting and among community partners. The Minnesota Roundtable on Early Childhood Education, which was also initiated in 1973, continues to bring together many of the leading national scholars and policymakers to Minnesota to speculate beyond current data and offer intuitive hunches about young children and how best to provide for their psychoeducational needs. SEED has continued to thrive and has expanded over the past 40 years in its outreach and research activities under the strong leadership of the late Mary McAvoy and more recently Scott McConnell, Amy Sussman Stillman, and Christopher Watson. From a small suite of offices in the Institute of Child Development with a very tiny staff to wonderful facilities on the St. Paul campus with a vast cadre of staff and students, SEED has grown in so many ways. There are just three lessons that I learned, well, I shouldn't say they're just, there are three lessons that I will tell you that I learned from my years with SEED. One, program development demands that we keep our fingers on the socio-political and economic pulse of our culturally diverse society. The goals of programs for children and families and for professionals who work with them must reflect the beliefs and values of their cultures. Number two, programs must be cooperative ventures, including parents and professionals. They must be multidisciplinary and include the points of view of healthcare providers, social service professionals and educators, among others. And most importantly, programs and practices must be grounded in sound research. And finally, there is also a mandate that we be connected to the policy-making process at local, state, and national levels. Action in the political arena determines funding priorities 
and in turn affects the nature of programs and services and the scope of our professional training programs. So please raise your glass to honor and to celebrate SEED. May it thrive and realize the hopes and dreams of its founders. L'chaim.